Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2019 National Partners Lunch. We're really thrilled that, that you are here and have joined us. If I could interrupt you for just a moment and ask you if you would please stand and join with me in reciting our Pledge of Allegiance. The award is named in honor of the 
first recipient, the Honorable John W. Dixon, a former Defense Department Deputy Controller who over 20 years transformed a small, unprofitable subsidiary of LTD Incorporated into eSystems, an enterprise producing electronic components, communications, and data systems for the U.S. military that had amassed more than one billion in revenue and a backlog of 1.6 billion at the time of his retirement in 1987. Mr. Dixon continued to serve as the system's chairman emeritus until his death in 1989. Over the past three decades, some of the biggest names in the defense industry have received the Dixon Award, including Norman Augustine of Lockheed Martin, Bill Swanson of Raytheon, Linda Hudson of BAE Systems, Wes Bush of Norfolk Brown, James Miller of General Dynamics, and last year's recipient, Roger Crum, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Lighthouse. This year's recipient is equally noteworthy and would relate very well with Mr. Dixon, I think. Will General Hamm and Mr. Peter Martin of Ameripac please join me on stage? Thank you. 
Latin saying about hard work and patriots. Our proudest accomplishment, accomplishment is the support for the American soldier and their families. I feel privileged to have led our team in providing great products and generosity in our military. I would like to thank those, those two tables over there and a lot of my other friends that are here that have made the trip to honor this award. Now, I hope they're still my friends after I get done because they've heard my jokes a thousand times. <laughs> so it, it is what it is. You had to show up anyway. Okay. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Lenny, and my son, Peter. Peter is Captain America Jr. Okay? So we're expecting him to take over after uh, it kind of fades out a little bit. Um, they, they are the foundation of our, our family. And they allow me to do what I do. We've got great patience, believe me. And I would not be here without, without them. Uh, gratitude is one of my core values. At a very young age, my parents taught me the importance of being grateful and channeling that gratitude into giving back to the community. My mom always wanted us to move to the United States. We were born in Canada for better opportunities. For my sister, Suzanne, and my brother Eric and myself. Part of that was, though, I failed in 11th grade at Catholic school in Canada. Now, who does that? So she says to me, I'm not only really embarrassed, I think we have to go to states you need to start. So that's why, that's why I'm here and doing what we're doing. My dad served in World War II in the Canadian Navy as a signalman. And uh, they were transporting uh, to Londonderry. They were uh, guarding the ship going over. And he got shot. Uh, his boat got shot by a uh, German U-boat uh, uh, torpedo. Dad went down with, and I did not, he didn't tell the story until he was eight years old. Dad went down with 11 of them on a rack, all his crewmates. Within 10 minutes, there were three left. They were in the North Atlantic, in a raft. The mess comes up, they hooked themselves in, they died of exposure. So a U.S. submarine comes and saves the last three that are on the raft. My dad, his best friend from his hometown, and his other best friend. And one of them, both of them are all 19. So they, they come off, one comes off, dad comes off second. And the last thing he sees is his best friend from his hometown. The squall comes up, the raft goes up, salt goes down, salt comes up. Wrath goes on. They never found any of the other nine. So, my, uh, my dad was so grateful to the U.S. Army Forces. Freedom that we enjoy and the happiness.
events in our lives are gifts bestowed upon us by the sacrifice of the military and our families. As business leaders, we have a choice. We have a choice about how we use these gifts. These gifts come with responsibility. As business leaders in the defense industry, we have a responsibility to use our freedom for the selfless service of those who defend it. We have an undeniable obligation to support those protecting us. We all have to do our part. I have come to accept that part will not include me becoming a GI, obviously. We need soldiers in the battle. With that realization, I have worked on the ways to play my part and support our armed forces. I always believe that if we can make our soldiers' lives just a fraction easier, then we're on the right path. And Meripat can do this in two ways. First, up, first way is by building durable functional cases to protect the equipment and technology that you guys developed so that we make sure that when it is there, it works. We take pride in our products and our contribution to the fight. The second way is by supporting our warriors when they return home. Our responsibility to these men and women does not stop at the front lines. Meripat strives to maintain a connection to those in uniform, especially when they return. I know I'm preaching to the choir to those in uniform. It's, I'm sorry, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but our men and women deserve to feel secure, useful, and appreciated every time they return home. Working with organizations such as AUSA, Fisher House, Tax, Special Operations Work Foundation, Wounded World Project, we do that to support, America PAC does that to support our warriors. The AmeriPAC way and our mission and responsibility is to protect them going forward and to take care of them on return. I'm honored to be the first small business to receive this award at AmeriPAC, which happens to be our 30th year, and this is the 30th year of the, of the Economy of the Award. For our, for our uh, contributions. The words of President Theodore Roosevelt kind of captured this sentiment. He said, do what you can with what you have where you are. This is ingrained in our DNA at America. We will never have the biggest profits or the largest staff, but we will always put our warriors at philanthropy first. It is our responsibility Thank you again to the Association of the United States Army for this humbling award, and thanks to everyone in attendance today for your compassion, generosity, and commitment to service is deeply touching. We are so blessed to live in, in the greatest country in the world. Keep supporting the warriors of this nation and their families, and you can always count on their path to do the same. But before General Hand gives you the hook, I have to ask how many people out of here, how many folks are either Irish or Irish descent? <laughs> oh, great. Since I'm the chief entertainment officer, I gotta tell my Irish joke. So if you hear any groans from those two tables that were invited by me, don't listen to them. Alright, so here's how, here's how it goes. So Patty buys a puppy, and the puppy's sick. So he goes to Father O'Malley and says, Father, is there a chance you could say a prayer for your poor puppy at Sunday Mass? Father O'Malley looks at me and says, Are you crazy, Patty? We're a house of worship. You don't pray for pets. So Patty says, Well, Father, what if I get out of the Protestant church and they offer him five hundred dollars to say a prayer for your poor puppy? Father O'Malley's eyes open wide, he looks straight at Patty and he goes, Holy Jesus, man, you didn't tell me your puppy was Catholic. <laughs>
Many of you know him. He's a friend of the Army, he's a friend of soldiers, sailors, air and marine, coast guardmen, their families, he's a friend of business. Before going to the VA, uh, he was the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, and in that job served as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense of Total Force Management. And he served with Secretary Mattis, and he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense with both Secretary Rumsfeld and Secretary Gates. That's where I first had the opportunity to, to meet then Secretary Wilkie, Wilkie as he was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Legislative Affairs. He's been Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Senior Director of the National Security Council. He is today <coughs> our Colonel of the United States Air Force Reserve. He previously served in the Navy Reserve with the Joint Forces Intelligence Command, Naval Special Warfare Group 2, and with the Office of Naval Intelligence. Uh, though he is born a cloth of the Air Force and a cloth of the Navy, I gotta tell you, underneath that man beats the heart of a soldier. He is the son of a soldier. And those of you who know him, he grew up in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That's a pretty good upbringing. That gives one strength and character to, to continue on and persevere. And I suspect that it was in following the model of his father, following all those great uh, paratroopers at the age second airborne division at the 18th Airborne Corps that was, that was then planted in Secretary Wilkie the, the necessity, the call to serve the nation, which he has done admirably for many, many years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the Honorable Robert Wood. Well, thank you, General Ham. Um, I'm going to validate what General Ham said. Uh, I was privileged to grow up at Fort Sill and Fort Bragg. My military career took me in the opposite direction. Uh, I am the first Wilkie since the war with Mexico who is not an artillery officer, and I beg your indulgence. But it was those traditions and that culture of the United States Army that I still know, know best and revere the most, and it is always an honor for me to be here with you. Um, I'm going to violate the first rule of public speaking by recognizing just a few people in an audience so that an audience I know a lot of folks and churches said never do that because it makes somebody mad. So I will take that chance. Uh, my friend General McConnell, it is an honor as always for me to be with him and it is a great blessing that you are leading the Army of the United States. General R. Richardson and I have shared a lot of combat in the most dangerous place on this planet, Capitol Hill. <laughs> so it's good to see you too, General. And my old friend, Pat Hickerson, who is in her last year as a member of the Board of AUSA, and she has done so much as a trailblazer and as a supporter of soldiers everywhere. And it's good to see you, man. <laughs> so, I'm now going to talk about somebody who's not here, uh, General Jim Linder, who just retired after decades of exceptional service, leading special warriors around the world. He uh, is partially responsible for getting me out of football purgatory. Now, you know in, in the South, football is religion. And when I say football purgatory, I tend to break far too much. Our mascot is a Baptist preacher. Our football home is named after Arnold Palmer. But my son followed General Linder's advice and he became an engineering student at Clemson University. The champions. The people who sent me say the back of his Tuscaloosa home to the last few years. I had an opportunity to talk to the Clemson team and the Corps of Cadets last year. And I told them with a straight face that I was part of an organization that contributed to all of the great records of Clemson's Memorial State. The most points scored by Clemson in the first one. The most points scored by Clemson at halftime. It was 87 points that they put on four. And you know, Clemson has a tradition. They have that wonderful tiger down the 
I've never seen so much. And he does push ups to match the number of points in four folks that were 73 to nothing in the third quarter on a hot South Carolina afternoon, and the tiger disappeared. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the ambulance comes out of the Clemson tunnel. The tiger is splayed out, the little tiger hat is off, his face is red as a cookie. At the end of the day, Coach Rowe had a press conference, and he was asked a profound question as only a member of the fifth state can ask, ask it. He said, Coach, is there anything you can say about today's game? He said, yeah, we killed that damn time. <laughs> it, is, it is great to be here, and I thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to start by talking about something that General Hamm I, I was privileged to grow up in the company of heroes. Uh, warriors who, who walk sideways because of the decorations that they wore on their chest. And warriors who were asked more than once to go to Southeast Asia. Now we'll talk about them a little later. But I've been spending a lot of time celebrating. 100th anniversary of the end of the Great War, the explosion of the United States of America onto the world stage, conflict that still impacts us today. And it was 101 years ago yesterday that a scratch farmer from Powell Mount, Tennessee, by the way, Buncombe County, North Carolina, found himself deep inside German lines in the Buse Arkham. He was a corporal in the 82nd Infantry Division, and he started receiving heavy German fire. But the Germans had to show their heads to get to him, and he started picking them off one by one. He later wrote, every time I saw the one, I took him out. After he killed a dozen or so German soldiers, the Germans in the sector surrendered their superior force. Ninety of them marched back with three soldiers of the All-American Division. And that detachment later picked up another 132 German prisoners. When he arrived, the assistant division commander of the 1st Infantry Division told him, I hear you captured the whole damn German army. He said, no, sir. I only got 132. That man received the hero's welcome. When he returned home, he was immediately sought out by advertisers, Hollywood, and others who wanted his endorsement. But he shunned them, and he declined every offer in a way only a man from East Tennessee could. He said, my uniform ain't the same. He later agreed to have his story told in 1940 by Hollywood, and he signed off on Gary Cooper playing him just as another global conflict was brewing. His condition was that the prophets was the 1940 best picture of the year would go two places, to a Bible school in East Tennessee and to a soldier's relief fund for soldiers from Tennessee who had served in the United States. He said something else that was more important. Uh, when some started to question the wisdom of fighting both the Great War and now that America at that time was on the verge of fighting another global conflict. He said the thing that these so-called experts forget is that liberty and freedom and democracy are so very precious that you don't fight to win them once and then stop. Liberty and freedom and democracy are prizes awarded only to those peoples who fight to win them and keep fighting forever to hold on to them. His experience, Alvin C. Luke, on the battlefields of Europe was unique, yet he was only one of 41 million Americans who had taken up arms since the first shots were fired at Lexington Green in April of 1770. Those Americans knew that York was right when he said that the fight would never end for these principles that we all hold so dear. 
There were others with New York at that time. A nearsighted farmer from Jackson County, Missouri, who lied and cheated to get into the field of artillery because he could not bear the thought of his friends and neighbors going to war and he not being there to support them. He had two horses shot from under him. And he would go on to be one of the greatest presidents in our history, Harry Truman. My great grandfather was there, a small town lawyer from the Mississippi Delta who had a part time teaching job at Ole Miss when he arrived at Camp Gordon, Georgia to join up with the Army Assembly there. On another part of that cantonment was my wife's grandfather, a 17 year old from southeastern North Carolina who had never ventured much beyond two or three counties in the Carolinas, but before he was 18, he was marching up the Champs-Élysées into the hell of the Meuse-Argonne. There were other stories as well. But as a child, I learned firsthand that the price of freedom is not free, as we all know, but that the recognition of those who carry the burden can sometimes be fleeting. Uh, as General Ham mentioned, uh, my father went to Vietnam three times. He was a big man for his day, 6'2", 240. Today, that's not even a quarterback. But in 1970, that's a big man. He was so grievously wounded in the invasion of Cambodia that he spent a year at Tripler before returning to us wearing half of what he did when he left. And the only thing that kept him going, other than his family, was this wonderful, wonderful United States Army and the great graces of General Creighton Abrams, who overruled the medical board and said, no, this officer will be allowed time to recover. And he did, and he returned to Fort Bragg. But he returned to America that is very different from the one that we see today. My father, a senior officer in the All-American Division, was not allowed to wear his uniform off post because of the times. And ladies and gentlemen, this was not Cambridge, Massachusetts or Berkeley, California. This was southeastern North Carolina, the heart of Richard Nixon country. And there were other things that I witnessed during those times. In elementary school and kindergarten, there was always a chance that when a classmate was called to the principal's office, that child was not going to a doctor's appointment, that there was bad news from Southeast Asia. That happened one day in April of 1975. President Ford had ordered the evacuation of all the orphanages in the Saigon era before the North Vietnamese Army entered that city. He called it Operation Baby Lift. One of the folks who volunteered for that assignment was Master Sergeant, medic, United States Air Force named Denny Cicero Johnson from Harnett County, North Carolina. On April 4th, his C-5 lifted off from Tan Sanut Air Base and never made it to the other end of the runway. 138 lost their lives that day, mostly Vietnamese children. But there were 11 airmen on that plane who did not return. On April 4th of this year, I escorted my classmate, Denise Johnson, to panel 1W of the Vietnam Memorial, 44 years after her father lost his life, and watched her touch his name, one of the last four on that wall. All of this is a history lesson into why the Department of Veterans Affairs exists. It exists because during the most pestilential of conflicts, the President of the United States said in the greatest of speeches ever delivered by a president, the second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, that it is our duty to care for all who have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan. This nation has corrected many of the mistakes that took place in the 1970s, and support for our veterans is both high and it is bipartisan. 
Uh, I gave a speech last week at the Nixon Library and said that President Nixon would be amazed that even Hollywood stands up for veterans. That's how far we have come. But in our efforts to make sure that we live up to Abraham Lincoln's vision, it is our duty to provide all of those who return and who have served with a welcoming family, a modern 21st century healthcare administration. And I often fall back on my own father's experience. When he retired, he carried around with him an 800-page paper record. It was the only record of his service that began being built when he was in ROTC a couple of months before John Kennedy was elected. We now have, thanks to General McConnell, a partnership with the United States Army so that when that young soldier enters the military entrance processing station, we have an electronic record that will be available to him, to the VA, that everyone can see, and we will no longer face the possibility that those who have served will have lost the record of their sacrifice. <laughs> I will also say, thanks to our partnership with the Department of Defense, that VA finally, finally has a modern 21st century healthcare supply chain. Thanks to the good graces of the Department of the Army and to General Mattis, I signed a memorandum of understanding that makes VA now part of the Defense Logistics Agency, so no longer will VA doctors in the middle of an operation have to run across the parking lot to a civilian hospital to get the material that they should have had when the operation began. And I thank the Army for everything it has done on that score as well. So we have also come off the most transformative legislation since the GI Bill, the Mission Act. Now, only the Congress would come up with an acronym like Mission. It stands for something integrated, healthcare networks. Uh, I, I just refer to it as reform. Uh, what the Mission Act does is it says that soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines will no longer have to drive hundreds of miles to get to a VA facility. They have the opportunity to go into the private sector when their needs demand it, and we will support them in that endeavor. The other thing that we do is that finally, our veterans are put on the same playing field as their neighbors. No longer do they have to suffer the weight and the anxiety in an emergency room. We now tell America's 20 million veterans, you have access to urgent care. And that is a long time coming. I, I also want to uh, take a moment and address something that um, I think many of you have heard about, um, and that is, uh, the issue of privatization of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I approach that in a very clinical, almost Trumpian way. Um, I presented to the Congress the largest budget in the history of our department, $220 billion, calling for 400,000 employees spread across 170 hospitals and 1,200 clinics. Only in Washington, D.C. would that be evidence that we are trying to privatize what is a veteran's right. So we are continuing to make sure that your department is there for you when you need it. I will um, close with what I think is our most pressing matter. And since General Hickerson knows, I, I tend to refer most of my stories either back to the Roman Empire or to 19th century America. I'm going to do it this time. I want you to go back to March of 1893. A major general from the Union Army was about to depart the White House and return home to Indiana. His name was Benjamin Harrison. Now, he's not known for much other than being in between two non-successive terms of Grover Cleveland. 
But General Harrison had seen enough of the carnage on the battlefields of the Eastern United States to have a special place in his heart for those who had borne the battle in that terrible war. And he ordered the United States Army to begin to collect statistics on the numbers of soldiers who take their lives every year. The United States Army began collecting statistics on veteran suicide in 1893. And for the first time, we are finally having a national conversation about soldiers' suicide. We are finally having that national conversation that does not just look at the last tragic act in a soldier's life, but looks at the continuum of issues that might lead to that tragic act. Mental health, addiction, and homelessness. We don't want another president of the United States to begin, as Benjamin Harrison did, to compile those awful statistics. 20 a day. 20 a day, that's been a steady number since the 19th century. Of those 20, a few are on active duty. Most of them are from my father's era in Vietnam. But 14 of those 20, we have no contact with. I convened yesterday for the first time, the first all government panel to finally deal with soldiers' suicide, bringing together HHS, Indian Health, the Department of Defense, and HUD, and the National Institutes of Health to come up with a holistic, medical, social answer to the problem that has, has confounded us now for well over 100 years. It is our number one clinical priority, and I thank the United States Army for everything it is doing to help those warriors who probably need more help than anyone. So, <laughs> the goal there is to have all of us working together to do what Alvin York said, to protect liberty and freedom, but also those who have had the incommunicable experience of war. It is also needed because we can never repeat what I saw as a child. We must be the welcoming, the homecoming force that our warriors deserve. They went to serve their country and that was never meant to be the end of what they experienced. They entered a community that is unlike any. So every time you look to protect our warriors in the field or hire them or help fund pro-veterans causes like the Fisher House, you are doing more than helping these deserving young people. You are setting an example for this country and reminding everyone that we have our veterans to thank it's not the pundit, it's not the professor, it is not the protester. It is those young people who have never shied away from the call of duty. So when Sergeant York passed away in 1964, Lyndon Johnson sent the ultimate army representative to his funeral, the greatest of airborne warriors, Matthew Bunker Ridgway. Ridgway was there. And I often think of General Ridgway on the evening of D-Day. As many of you know, he had led the All-American Division to victory in North Africa and Sicily and was tasked by General Eisenhower with planning the airborne assault on Hitler's Fortress Europe, the All-American Division, the Screaming Eagles and the British First Airborne. And the night before, he couldn't sleep. He was so restless that he fell out of his cot. And he reached for the Old Testament and he grabbed down the, the book of Joshua and turned to that promise that Joshua received on the evening of the Battle of Jericho. I shall not fail thee nor forsake thee. In 1986, General Ridgway was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Ronald Reagan. And Reagan said, heroes come when they are needed and great men step forward when courage seems in short supply. 
So that is what AUSA is about. That is what the Department of Affairs is about. It is about not failing or forsaking those who have borne the battle. And it is about never failing or forsaking those great men and women who have stepped forward during all of those times when courage seems in short supply. So I thank AUSA for everything that you do. I thank you all for supporting the men and the women of our armed forces. I thank you for bringing me back to a happier time when I watched the artillery half section roll across the old post quadrangle at Fort Sill and the mass jumps of the 82nd Airborne Division over the Normandy and Sicily drop zones. Thank you for everything you do for America and God bless you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Wilkie. Uh, certainly for your, your comments, your thoughtful comments, your inspiring words today, but, but more so, frankly, thanks for your decades of service, your commitment uh, to help this nation be stronger. And those of us at the Association of the United States Army, all assembled here uh, this afternoon, are thankful that our nation has leaders such as yourself who have stepped forward in tough times to help make us all better. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. Okay, uh, we're going into the final stretch of the AUSA annual meeting. Uh, General McQuistian has informed me we have two bits of breaking news to report. Uh, the Association of the United States Army has been on a pretty steady increase in the overall membership, and today, our membership crested 162,000. That's, uh, that's 100,000 more than we were a few years ago. And, and also today, you, all those who have joined, we are now well over 32,000 people who have attended, attended this annual meeting. Uh, that's 1,000 plus more than last year. A big, big number. Thank you all very, very much. We deeply appreciate it. So with that, that concludes our 2019 National Partner Luncheon. Thank you all for your sustained support. We look forward to seeing you the rest of the afternoon, this evening at the Marshall Dinner, and be back here uh, one year from now for the 2020 annual meeting. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>